First, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today uh, for what I think will be a really important and uh, interesting event and one that I hope spurs everyone to do more than just be with us on Zoom, but uh, take some actions as well. I'm really pleased to have everyone who's on this call with us. Um, and we're especially glad that Sandra DeVries, filmmaker of the film Out, The Making of a Revolutionary, is here to talk about that and the issues in that film. And the subject of the film, Laura Whitehorn, is here with us, along with several activists, uh, Shamika Parrish Wright and Donna Robinson, um, who are working on the issues of decarceration, which is the issue we're talking about today. And so I'm gonna let um, Sonja take over in a second. I just wanna say a little bit about Third World Newsreel, which is an alternative media organization that is now in its 51st year of existence. And um, it became, started out as a radical film collective that covered um, movements starting in the late 60s and early 70s and continues to work um, with emerging filmmakers of color and distributing the films are in about communities of color and social justice issues. And uh, part of what we do besides education distribution and training of emerging filmmakers of color is hold events where we show films and have people talk about the issues because the whole point of the media we work with is that we help people do something more than just watch, but actually do something about it. So. Thank you all for coming, and uh, I'm going to let Sonja take over. Okay, wonderful. And you're going to do the admitting now, right? Yes. Okay, because I'm going to lose track. Um, first of all, I just want to uh, give a very big thanks, um, especially to JT and to Third World Newsreel for, for making this possible, for putting the film out, The Making of a Revolutionary, on Vimeo so that people can see it for free during this time and for suggesting that we try to have a panel, um, you know, along with that. And so uh, a lot of things. I know there's been a lot of back and forth and a lot of energy, so I really appreciate that. Um, and I just wanted to give a shout out. I don't think she's on the call, but Rhonda Collins was the co-director for Out, a brilliant filmmaker. And um, if you haven't seen it, or haven't seen, I haven't watched it recently, I really encourage you to go look at it again. I think it's a really uplifting film, you know, and um, the way we had to present it to Laura, because of course she didn't want a film focusing on her, was that it would just be really a story of that time and the underground movement that grew out of the civil rights, anti-war, black liberation. And especially at that time, um, uh, Rhonda and I wanted to make a film that focused on um, the way that some white people had really chosen to make a commitment to fighting white supremacy and racism and um, really some of them, you know, making the ultimate commitment because we need examples of that as well and unfortunately there aren't that many examples of that, um, you know, and uh, one of the uh, wonderful things in the film of, of many is Laura gives a definition of um, many white liberals who want social justice, but they want to determine what that looks like for people of color. And, um, and so, so the example of Laura and others like Laura is um, so important. And um, so I also uh, wanted to acknowledge that this film is 20 years old. Um, so that's why it, it, in part of the resources we're giving uh, links for updates on the political prisoners, especially at that time there were a hundred political prisoners. Um, you know, in 20 years, some people have gotten out, some people have passed on. Um, I wanted to just take a moment to remember um, Nahanda Abiyadun, who uh, had been living in Cuba. She was self-identified as part of the Black Liberation um, Army, was a hip hop activist and just an incredible um, activist and mentor of young, pe young people, um, especially when she was living her later years in Cuba and she died about a year ago. Um, so I just want to remember her um, and, you know, also just remember that people like Leonard Pelcher, Matula Shakur, David Gilbert, Mumia Abu-Jamal, they're still in there. So these people have been in there for uh, more than 40 years. 
And I, um, and that's one reason I think this is so important because in my experience, when I first started doing work around political prisoners, there was a real divide around doing work around the prisons and jails, and then the political prisoners. And then there was another divide with um, <clears throat> the left um, and not wanting to support people who had been involved in what they called violence. You know, and that's another really important discussion that a lot of people are having at this time of not making a distinction around the violent and the nonviolent prisoners. Um, you know, and something that gives me hope is that I do think there's um, a deeper understanding um, and we can see that in some of the work that's happening. You know, at the same time, COVID-19 has just really illuminated the uh, horrible inequalities in our society, the very deliberate inequalities. Um, and, you know, the, the, um, the rates of death from it amongst the black and brown communities uh, in prison and outside of prison is so much higher because of this. Um, so I think, you know, it's a, it's a devastating time. And uh, one of my mentors, Ann Braden, always used to say, oftentimes in these kind of crises is also an amazing time to be able to organize. It's an opportunity to really broaden our organizing, get more creative, and, and that's what I'm seeing too. And so um, what we're going to do today is uh, Donna, Shamika, and Laura are each going to share. Um, after that, I want to encourage people to put questions in the chat. Um, we'll be taking questions. I have some questions already, so we'll start out with those and then we'll take some questions. And um, when we come towards the end, which will be probably in about an hour, um, you know, each person will get a chance to, to wrap it up and also give a call to action. And we will, as I said before, be putting out all those resources and organizations and movies and different things that will support people's actions um, <clears throat> in the information and we can also send it out. Um, so, I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce, let's see, I think we came up with Shamika going first. So um, <laughs> I've had the honor of knowing Shamika, um, I guess, since she moved here from Cincinnati uh, quite a few years ago. Um, Shamika is just through and through a community activist and organizer. She's the operation manager at the Bail Project Louisville. Um, she's also the child of an incarcerated parent and formerly incarcerated herself. She works with families during visitation um, with the kids. She's on the board of Ann Braden Institute, Sowers of Justice, and I mean, we'd spend the whole time here if I told you what else Shamika was involved in. But, you know, if it's a struggle for justice of any kind, Shamika's there. Um, so, Shamika, you, you ready? Uh oh, where'd Shamika go? Here. No, I'm not ready, but I will get <laughs> ready as we go. <laughs> All right. Um, I didn't expect to go first. I wanted to hear Laura first, but I did just watch the documentary with my children um, just before the call and just so powerful. And I feel honored to be here. At first, I was like, wait, they just need to hear from Laura. They don't even need to hear from me. Um, but I, I do think it's important to talk about, you mentioned earlier before the call started about the differences between uh, jails and prisons. And so because of the work that I'm doing around um, pretrial incarceration, I think it's important. And, and so I'll try to speak from that and just, just those experiences. Um, I will tell you all, I'm still processing everything that I just saw in, in the out film and I, I'm just, blown away and there's so many connections and there's so many things that are so relevant even for today. Um, one of my 20 year old daughters said, this could be, this is relevant for right now. And it's so, so true. It's so real and it's so true. So thank you for being, everyone that was involved for being courageous and to share that. And even in times of now where people are, are, are running away from things that, that look like it might have any connection to balance, to talk about balance today is so important because poverty is mm -hmm. balance. 
because our country has been violent and we don't often talk about that um, enough. And so now people, even myself, my justice involvement uh, was considered violent. And so in 1995, I found myself 18 years old, my first offense, when well, I first charged, fighting myself out of a domestic relationship. And um, where poverty comes in, I was a single mom of, I had a three-year-old daughter. I had her at 15 and um, he was the son of a sheriff for 29 years. And so imagine that when I get arrested for fighting him back and using a weapon, I heard all the talks and, and people were looking and staring and pointing at me as soon as I got, I got to the booking floor. Um, and I never was treated as someone who was defending herself at any juncture and knowing what that means and knowing sitting there and not and I had written everything down that happened didn't know that I was just signing my warrant even worse and um but anyway to have your ex-fiance come to the court and tell the judge I provoked her I hit her I did these things to her and for the judge to look you in your face and say I don't care you had no reason to hit him back with a weapon um, to know that when I was offered a plea deal, um, two years probation with an aggravated assault charge, I was charged with felonious assault next to murder. So as I was housed as an 18-year-old, I was housed with people who had, were on their way to prison who had been convicted of murder, and, um, and so they called me the baby of the unit. But that, but just understanding that even in that situation, I was surrounded by women who, black and white, who wanted to make sure that I was okay. In the midst of this horrible time in their life as well, they were worried about me because they, they saw that happen to too many people and they saw too many people go on the prison just for defending themselves. So anyway, um, fast forward, I would have never thought more now, more than 20 years later, that three-year-old is now 27 years old with her, with her own daughter now, but I would have never seen myself doing this work and being surrounded by everyone that I know here and the people that are in the community. I just wanted to get out. I just wanted to get on with my life. And so, um, but when I watched this and I, and I'm, I have over the years have been reading and learning more about political prisoners more and more every year. There's no way um, I'm not invested in, in trying to understand the thought processes and everything that happened and the decisions that were made to decide to, to put your body on the line in such a way is so powerful. And I know that we all like to think that all of our work is putting our bodies on the line, but that is just to say, I'm gonna lay down in this way is a beautiful thing and it's so powerful and I'm just so blown away. So to um, this gentleman here is my father who spent, that's me. I had to be about 13 when he got out of prison and he took me to my first concert. Um, and so back then they used to do these wanted posters and stuff like that. Um, but that man died at 56 um, a few years ago and he spent 40 of those 56 years in and out of jail, in and out of prison. 10 year bids, five year bids, three years, different things like that. Um, but he is who gave me um insight on what it's like to that the life is like he definitely didn't want me to follow in his path but he wanted me to know what was out there he was the reason why i'm connected to prisoners rights work why why i'm passionate about it why i know that those visitations and those letters and those communications for him over all those years is what steered me into the shamika you see before you um how important it was for me to talk to him and not only because I was his only child and he didn't know how to be my father, but he knew he had to warn me about this world and what I was gonna face. And he was able to do that and able to be a, a grandfather to my six kids in a way that he couldn't be my father. And so I know that aspect of it is being someone who had that adverse childhood experience of, of having an incarcerated parent for all of her life mostly. And also I know that he was so brilliant that that wasn't just who he was, he was brilliant, but he was also caught up in the system. So while watching the film, um, I thought about the power in people. I thought, the, uh, of course, about how relevant it is to, time, to the times that we're dealing with now. I thought about how we motivate more people to get involved 
and how we do not let balance be a distraction when that's something that's been used way before our time, centuries and centuries ago, and we're letting people distract us with balance. So much so that now we have 1,222 people in our local jail who are there. And these are the people that folks have already made a decision that we've gotten out who we needed to get out. Now these people we have to fight harder for because they may have a quote unquote balance charge. Um, and, and I'm finding my work harder and harder every day to focus on, on reducing our jail popu our local jail population because of the people that are in there are the people that a lot of people have written off already. And, and, and although they may not be deemed as political prisoners, them being in there and being held is political. It's very political and there's no way to escape that. So we've been doing this work locally um, with the Bell Project. Um, if you want to learn, learn more about the Bell Project, you can go to bellproject.org. But the, the basic understanding is that public defenders who have been public defenders decided we want to get together and we want to see if we can give the people that we want, we're serving a fighting chance. And believe me, I know firsthand you look better showing up to court in your own clothes than in a jumpsuit because that's exactly what happened to me. My fiance was in a suit and I was in an orange jumpsuit. So that judge never saw me. All he saw was him. And that's what's happening all the time. And we wanna give people a fighting chance. We wanna level the playing field as much as we can in a, in a, in a system that has so many baked in uh, biases and, and imperfections and, and racism and everything else. Um, we know that people don't have a chance. So we literally now have current state representatives who are getting violent charges but are out on the street not because the society didn't say they couldn't get out but because they were able to afford their twenty five thousand dollar bail their fifteen thousand dollar bail and so now folks are saying in this situation where it's basically like a natural disaster that is not about if it's coming it's definitely coming um and people are in these petri dishes in these jails and prisons they're telling them you're not worthy to get out and why are you not worthy? Because you're black, brown, and because you're poor. And so now we are at the end of our lives for some folks, and we're and we're deciding who can who can basically get on a boat and who can't. And that's horrible. And and so any elected official or anyone who is making those kind of decisions really has to have the people have to have us in their ear and letting them know that this isn't right. So our our connections to the community is so important. Groups like El Surge, Louisville Showing Up for Racial Justice, all of us are working together to fight this from every angle. So as we're working to bail people out, um, El Surge is door knocking and and doing Freedom Fridays and and talking to people and, and getting the ear that they wouldn't hear me. I remember starting these meetings and people hardly looked me in my face. But now that we we're starting to change things, now those conversations are changing. So the community work that is involved in getting this done is people power. And that's what I saw in that film. That was people power, people saying enough is enough, and this is how we're going to have to deal with this. And not meaning that everybody fights it from the same level, but that everybody has a job and a purpose into ending these racist practices, this, this repression, this oppression, this everything that's going on, we all have a role to play in it. So I am honored to be here today to talk about my role in that. And I'm also now my brother, and he, I, I'm hoping to be able to pick him up on May 27th. He has tested positive for COVID-19 while he is in, in Ohio prison, and he is at the end of his 10-year sentence. And even more, the judge that sentenced my brother to 10 years also sentenced my father to 10 years when he was the age of my brother. And my, me and my brother don't share the same father, but the irony in that is ridiculous. And so now that my brother has done his time, he can literally die before he's able to come out and try to get his life back together for himself and his eight children. So I'm here professionally, personally, and I'm just so blown away and I cannot wait to hear from Laura and everyone else and to learn more. But um, in my closing statements, I'll, I'll bring in how you can help the work that we're doing. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you so much, Shamika. Um, it was really powerful. And I've been thinking about your brother a lot. And uh, 
You know, every time I hear you speak, I learn something new about you. So that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, all right. So next we're going to hear from Donna Robinson. And I want to give a special thank you to Donna because um, Dilcia Pagan, who was involved with the Puerto Rican independence movement, was going to be on here and was not feeling well. And um, so Donna, uh, Donna stepped up. And um, that's wonderful, because um, now we get to hear from her. Um, so Donna Robinson <clears throat> is a Western New York State Regional Organizer for, for RAP, which is Release Aging People in Prison. Um, she began her, her work with Prisoners Are People Too. She's a mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. And she has a daughter serving 15 years to life. Um, she became RAP's regional organizer when her daughter's mentor, one of her daughter's mentors, Valerie Gauter, died after 40 years of confinement. And so Donna's work is to make sure that doesn't happen to others. Um, so I give you Donna. Welcome, Donna. Thank you so much for inviting me here and I pray that uh, the speaker that was supposed to be on in my place feels better. Shamika, you blew me away. When you first came on the screen, you looked like you could be no more than 25 or 30 years old. And now you're telling me this story, how you've been out here advocating. And you literally had me in tears. I, I got my little tissue works going here, girl. God bless you. I mean, everything that you said was so spot on and it was the same thoughts that I was having when I, I watched this movie out. You know, God puts us in places where we never thought that we would be. And I'm speaking from experience. Um, as you can see, I have my rap. I'm very proud to be a member of the rap family. We're, we're like family and Laura Whitethorn. I can't say enough about her. I mean, you know, when I was barely getting out of high school, she was fighting for my, my rights and the rights of my community and my family members and just African-American people and people who were uh, underserved uh, and disadvantaged. And um, I wasn't even aware because I was, I was growing up in New Jersey. I'm a transplant here to Buffalo. I wasn't even aware of the sacrifices that she and her comrades made to be incarcerated for decades. Um, just because you're speaking out for what's right, that really, you know, it, it really got to me. And the fact that now at my age, I'm in my 60s and things are still the same. That really blew my mind. I am just, to be able to pick up my phone and call that uh, organization called Rap My Family is the only thing that probably saved me because uh, I was a single parent. And as uh, it was alluded to my daughter serving 15 years to life for a lot of things that I could have, I could have been incarcerated for and probably been out by now. You know, I tell everybody my story. I'm no different from any other African-American woman. And I, anything that you can think of happening to someone happens, it has happened to me and it's still happening. So I could trade places with any one of these elderly citizens that are incarcerated with my daughter in Bedford Hills. This is a maximum facility there. And I didn't pick up this banner until 
I realized that sitting on the side of my bed crying was not gonna help the situation. I couldn't be complicit. I couldn't sit by and let my legacy or, or, or my great grandchildren grow up thinking that I had a Nana and she didn't try to save my, my Nana or somebody else's Nana. That's not me. You know, I was born in 1955, the age of civil rights. My grandmother, she marched with Martin Luther King. I think it dropped the ball in my mother's generation and in these late stages in my life. I have to speak out for people that don't have a voice to speak out for themselves. I, I, I get it. You do things. You need to be punished. This is what how we raise our children but there's punishment and then there's torture and then there's this paradigm of perpetual punishment and the people who are my age and even my mother's age i see them at bedford hills some of them don't even know why they're there they've been there so long they have alzheimer's Keeping someone incarcerated for 50, 60 years, that's not rehabilitating them. And I can tell you from experience, it's no comfort to the family who's lost family members to victims, to, to, to domestic violence. We lost our cousin in 2000, murdered by her ex-boyfriend who my aunt moved into her home. They took him to Disney. And he repaid them by stabbing my cousin to death after they worked all night long at Federal Express. No one has reached out to the family to find out how we've been surviving. We just keep going from day to day. Yes, it haunts us. But when I took up the role of being an advocate, I had to go across the board. I can't carve anyone out. I can't ask for anyone to have compassion for my daughter, have compassion for her other uh, friends that she's made since there and mentors that she's gotten since she's been to Bedford Hill. I look at these women and I see queens like Valerie Gator serving a 50 to life sentence. Yes, she committed a heinous crime. She and her co-defendant. But 50 years before she could even get a parole hearing, that's not a, yo, you're coming home. So this is why I advocate for rap. Because they don't carve out anybody. They don't forget about the people who have been incarcerated, like political prisoners, people who are elderly, behind bars serving a death sentence because even though it says life on the end they want your life literally and it becomes a death sentence and when i met valerie gator she mentored my daughter taught her how to be a photographer showed her what she would need to do to survive because my daughter is just like like you were shamika never you know not in any trouble got pregnant young, raising four children by herself, working, doing whatever she had to do. You get caught up, I call it being unevenly yoked <clears throat> with someone that's not equal to your morals, your values, and then you get caught up. And you have no bail, no bail, no money for a good lawyer. They get you to sign your life away. Sign this, sign this, they're talking so fast. They did that to my daughter. A, a house caught on fire it was a rooming house her ex-boyfriend owned. They got her at the fire station. Police never warned Bob. Got her to sign a confession. Two men died from smoke inhalation. She signed her whole life away. Everybody that knows my daughter in their heart of hearts knows she couldn't do that. But nobody wanted to take the time. 
and this person, her ex-boyfriend, still communicates with her, puts money on her books. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with this picture? Women have been degraded and stepped on and just misogynized since Eve. I'm just going to take it all the way back. That's right. And from what I've seen since my daughter's incarceration at Bedford, there's many women who've been there way too long who should have been out. And now with the COVID-19, we just lost a citizen and my heart is breaking because she was around my age in her 60s, proclaiming her innocence since she got there. And she was from Buffalo, New York. She was our native daughter, succumbed to COVID-19. As you know, medical in, in prison is none. Tylenol, that's what they give you. This system is working just the way it was designed to fail. It's a money-making industry. They don't care about us. This is why I was so overwhelmed with how I saw Laura Whitethorn, the Black Panthers band together and make a change. I've been blessed in my lifetime to have met some of these people who they claim were violent, the Black Panther members. Robert Seth Hayes, 45 years incarcerated, came home to Buffalo. My dearest friend and comrade, I listen to his voicemails now just to hear his voice because it hurts me so much. That he only had 18 months after 45 years. He came back to Buffalo willing, able, get on the bus with me with his walker to go to Albany and rally for our Elder Parole Act fair and timely parole because this was something that was important. He knows just like Jose, Jose Saldana, our executive director, and Laura says, we can't celebrate freedom because we are not free until all are free. So this is why I became involved with RAP, Prisoners of People 2, Hawk Cake Solitary Confinement, Alliance of Families for Justice, Surge Standing Up for Racial, racial Justice, Citizens Action, Push in Buffalo. We have a collective organization because there's strength in numbers. Right. And we as people, we have to stand up for one another. We have to speak up, tell our stories, no matter how painful it is, because your story is my story, is his story. This is history. And this is the only way that we can make a change. So again, I appreciate you inviting me here on the Saturday afternoon. It's, it's chilly in Buffalo. I keep my heat on 365 days. I'm old and I'm cold. Don't play. So thank you for inviting me. And God bless each and every one. Stay safe. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, it's really an honor to meet you for the first time and to hear your story and about your daughter. Um, and also, thank you for lifting up the reality of misogyny and the impact that that has. And what you said, the system is working the way it was designed. You know, people sometimes say, oh, the system doesn't work. And I'm always thinking, no, it's, it's working. It's just working for those on the top, mm -hmm. you know. But um, thank you so much for that. Um, so I'm going to introduce Laura. Um, I met Laura, uh, gosh, I think I was in my 20s <laughs> when Laura was out at FCI Pleasanton and I was visiting Dilcia Pagan. Um, Laura Whitehorn served 14 years in federal prison on the resistance conspiracy case. She was released in 1999. She was a senior editor at Pause for 10 years, a magazine chronicling the lives of people affected by HIV and AIDS. She's a co-founded rap, edited The War Before by late Black Panther um, political prisoner and organizer, Sophia Bukhari. And as always, continues to work for the release of all US held political prisoners um, and just has been a lifelong uh, activist. 
and an inspiration to many. So I give you Laura Whitehorn. Thanks, Sonia. Thanks to Third World Newsreel. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Shamika and Donna for those amazing summations of the situation in this country and where we're at. Um, I want to say one thing because you brought Nahanda's spirit to us, just that, um, yeah, I made, I, I cooperated with the making of out kicking and screaming. Um, and then uh, when, after it had been made, I was communicating with Nahanda Abiodun, who was in exile in Cuba. And she said that she got it translated with Spanish subtitles and used it in organizing in Cuba, where there was a big, there was a powerful um, queer and trans community, and people were fighting HIV and a whole bunch of anyway. You can look that up. Bob could probably give more of the actual history of that, but um, that that was encouraging to me, you know, because part of the reason you wanted to make the movie with me was you wanted an out lesbian and a Jewish lesbian, and you know, so this is. The only time I ever say, talk about being Jewish is when I talk about supporting uh, the struggle for justice in Palestine. Um, but, you know, so anyway. Um, gee, I'm not sure exactly where to start. I mean, Shamika, your story and your putting it all together is exactly why I worked with Kathy Boudin, another former political prisoner who did more time than I did. She did 22 years and the late Mujahid Farid, a, a hero of our hearts, um, who had done uh, 33 years on a, a 18 to life sentence. I mean, 15 to life sentence, he got an extra 18 years. And anyway, I guess what happened to me in prison was a couple of things. One is, and I see Donna Wilmot on this call, and she was did time with me and Marilyn and um, Dilcia and, Lucy and I, yeah, anyway, um, we, had a, we had a quorum of women political prisoners in, in the California prison at the time. Um, is that there's always, as I think Sonia said in the beginning, there's always been this political prisoners, social prisoners, political prisoners, prison system. And part of the reason why I wanted to raise up Attica, the film, um, part of it is just because it reminds us what the state how violent the state is. And you watch it and you think exactly what Shamika and Donna were talking about. about. So who gets to define what's, what's okay in terms of violence? I mean, and one of my complaints about um, our movements is that sometimes we deal as if the state in and of itself, the government, were not violent because they don't, they can cloak it, right? They don't, they don't have to carry around guns. Um, they have the police to do that. And we act as if the police and prisons are separate from like, you know, capitalist power, in, imperialism. We act as if um, they're the only way to show the connection between the United States and, uh, and the Zionist power of Israel over Palestine is to talk about, and I'm not putting down, I love JVP, but is to talk about the specific connections around deadly exchange and stuff. And there's so much more to it. It is an analysis of a system that is exactly working as it's supposed to, to keep black people, Native Americans, Latinx people from not just be, to be oppressed, but to keep them from having power. And so when I was in prison, I watched a couple of things happen. One was the phenomenon of all these political prisoners um, and people in the movements on the outside beginning to build around that with the, with the problem of people convicted of violence and especially black people convicted of violence. Let's be real. There were a lot of people who were willing to support my case because, and we had used violence, but we were white, mostly middle-class people. And, you know, it seemed like a choice in a way, whereas the black prisoners who had had to engage in war because that's what they were up against. Somehow that was less acceptable. So there's always that question. But I so I saw a connection. I saw a beginning of a movement to support political prisoners. Um, but I saw a distinction again where people couldn't see 
that even if all prisoners are not specifically political prisoners, and I should just say a political prisoner to me is someone who does something. Some people are incarcerated because of their political beliefs. Certainly, um, uh, uh, Geronimo Pratt, uh, uh, God, I can't believe I'm losing his name, um, was, was put in prison for 27 years and the government knew he was innocent. Leonard Peltier, you know, Mumia. There are people who are, f are framed or at least they're, they're overcharged or whatever because of their, and then there are people who did take actions um, to end imperialism and, and racism. Um, so anyone who did, but then everyone in prison is there because of a political system. So whether they were uh, a, a bank robber because they needed money to feed their family, whatever it was, it was because of a system of total inequity. And so that connection is, and I kept seeing it be made semantically like People wanted to define, define, define. You know, I always say this to people when people say, oh, why don't people know about political prisoners? I say, you want to know who knows who a political prisoner is? Any incarcerated person in the United States who was in, in New York State, we have a movement of formerly incarcerated people. And when you go around a room and people just call out names of people that are still inside or people they've lost, people you've never met before will call out Noah Washington or Herman Bell or Jaleel Muntakim because people inside understand the connections because they also, people understand that prisons are part of a larger system, they're not a separate thing. So the reason that we started RAP um, in, we can never remember what year it was, I don't know, 2012, 2013, and we were supported by Sophia Elijah, who's done a lot of work with um, political prisoners, is because Herman Bell, uh, Eddie Ellis, rest in peace, David Gilbert, I can't remember who else, all incarcerated, more formally incarcerated political prisoners said, we are not unique because there are many other people who are in prison who are aging and reaching this point where there is no reason that they're incarcerated except for making a point of the crime that they were incarcerated for. The other thing I saw while I was in prison was um, when I first went to prison, people thought my sentence that I faced was really long. By the time I got out, it was nothing compared to what other people were facing. Because in those years, and this is a, a point I think is really important, what we saw was, okay, COINTELPRO in the 70s and 80s put people in prison, killed people, Fred Hampton, Mark Clark, um, created terrible divisions, uh, did the counterintelligence program. If anyone on this call isn't familiar with it, um, there's a film that, that Claude Marx and Freedom Archives made called COINTELPRO 101. There are many books. Okay, so that was an attack on the leadership and the organizations in the Black Puerto Rican movement, all, the, all of the movements, the national liberation movements. And then, and Shokwe Lumumba was the first person that I heard say this, after COINTELPRO had done its had served its purpose, then the government analyzed where is the next movement of resistance going to come from? We better hit all those communities too. So you saw what we call mass incarceration, which is a political, it's not, it's not an aberration of, you know, too many people and, and wrong sentences because the politicians figured out that they could win by being tough on crime. It's a specific uh, program of, and I have to say, having been in prison with women, it's genocide because you're removing people from their community, you're removing the women from, during their childbearing years, and you're removing the elders, and those are all definitions, um, the UN uh, international law, part of the definition of genocide. So that's what we're up against, and we figured, okay, how do we make, how do we start in this big prison reform movement that was starting to, to um, to exist in New York around the Rockefeller drug laws and everywhere else around the drug cases. And, um, how do we make a dent in that in a way that both specifically includes political prisoners, because if people don't know, Fareed in particular um, did time with David Gilbert and with Herman, and with, he did time with everyone, but he worked with David Gilbert to create peer education programs for AIDS. How do we do something that includes them and also points to 
and educates people about and starts to undermine a fundamental pillar of the white supremacy that is the prison system. And we thought, well, who are the, what does it mean to have a, a sentence of 25 to life and go to the board over and over again for 20 more years? You know, what is that about? It's what Donna said, this, this paradigm of punishing um, black people in particular forever. And so we started there and we walked into a situation which I'm afraid it still exists more than we had hoped it would by now, where even the people who want to see some kind of reform want to see it for the quote low level nonviolent because that's easier to get to get um, support for it. So for example, today we just I just heard on the radio an interview with the governor of New Jersey who's being pressed to let people out during the COVID um, pandemic. And he actually said, because they pushed him, he actually said, people can, violent offenders will just have to be, they just have to stay in prison. Mm. In other words, they just have to take what, what comes. And so I want to make one point about language. I know I used to talk all about terrorism after, after 9-11 about using those words. And today the words are violent offender or violent criminal. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of saying, okay, when you were 19 years old, as one of our comrades was, you committed a violent crime, you killed someone. That makes you now at the age of 68, a quote, violent person. And if we can start to change some of that thinking by liberals, by radicals, by politicians, we can begin to make a dent in this question of people convicted of violence. So that's where RAP started. We had much more success than we thought we would. Um, we were able through a number of different things, pushing on regulations, pushing on uh, who gets to be a parole commissioner, to raise the, the, um, the number of people who get out on parole in New York. Fortunately for us, our wonderful director now, whom Donna mentioned, Jose Saldana, who um, when I first was working with him, I noticed that his email started YLP Saldana. And I thought, oh, I wonder what, whether that has anything to do with the young lords. Sure enough, he was a young lord before he was arrested. So um, my partner, Susie Day, just did a great interview between him and Johanna Fernandez about the young lords and incarceration. Um, I know I'm wandering here, so I'm gonna stop. But so RAP's, the, the last thing I wanna say is that RAP has a principle which Donna mentioned of not throwing anyone under the bus. And one of the things that um, we get hit with all the time is, well, if you would just carve out people, not just people con with violent convictions, but people convicted of killing cops. Um, and we won't do that. And uh, we're hoping that we will build a lot of support nationally because this, hopefully everything that the three of us have said is an action item because um, someone asked me to define the difference between liberals and radicals and revolutionaries. And the main difference between liberals and radicals anyway is talking about something and having a great rap to give about it, but not doing anything about it. So hopefully we will all work together. And um, we are, rap is an abolitionist. We're a specifically abolitionist group. We, mm -hmm. we want to destroy the prisons and have community have com communities deal with their own lives and uh, damage and um, and public health, and you know ultimately we are also anti-imperialists. So, all right, free them all. All right, woo! That was really just amazingly powerful. Um, and yes, all of you spoke about action. Um, um, and uh, JT's going to, I think, getting the questions in the chat. So if people have questions, please put them in the chat so JT can call them out. Um, anyway, I really appreciate you talking about how policing and the prison system is just, you know, we, they want us to separate that from this whole white supremacist economic system, capitalism, all that. But it's just, you know, hand in hand. Um, and, and the way that the prison system works to maintain it all, you know, and also to squash any potential dissent. Um, and you talked a little bit about abolition. 
Um, Because that's a discussion a lot of us have been having about how to do this work in the framework of abolition, prison abolition. Um, And so I would love to hear more about that from anybody. And then the other part of it, which I think is linked very much, is just, you know, working on the immediate issues, like right now, COVID-19, we're just trying to get everybody out that we can get out. But putting that also in the context of this much larger vision that you talked about. Um, And again, with prison abolition and transforming basically the whole system. Um, So (laughs) I know those are big questions, (laughs) but um, whoever wants to touch those. um, And I also just wanted to lift up, because I didn't know this until recently, and it makes so much sense with the way that this country was founded, with the enslavement of African people, with the genocide of indigenous people, And those two groups are the two groups that are disproportionately represented in prison. You know, and and that's so deliberate. Um, So anyway, if if any of you want to go deeper into some of those issues, and then JT will be finding the other questions. So just whichever one of you wants to launch into that. You know. <laughs> All right, well, I brought it up, so I'll start with um, okay. just that, you know, we are in an emergency, and this is, there's always a, a sort of a, a tension between the struggle to get a few people out if you can, and the struggle to, you know, transform a system. And we try to do both. But it is, in this period, for example, um, we've been asked to sign on to Uh, efforts to, you know, ask governments or uh, mayors or governors or parole boards for things like uh, house arrest or um, furloughs. And we really push, we don't, RAP doesn't sign on to those. I mean, we're not, like someone can get out on furlough and not be in prison. Okay. But what we're looking at is what does that mean for the future? Like we always point to that in New York State, when the death penalty was abolished, it was specifically replaced with life without parole sentences. And it seemed like, oh, yay, we're rid of the death penalty. Life without parole is death. It's just death by incarceration. And now we're part of a national movement to end, especially with people in California, the amazing drop LWAP movement there. Um, so we have to look at what are we what are we now in this emergency situation agreeing to that becomes uh, set into law? So um, we have to be careful about that and make sure that if anything, if they say, for example, okay, people can, who are vulnerable, you know, and we name, there's categories of people that the Centers for Disease Control have named as vulnerable, not just to COVID, to coronavirus itself, but to death because of their uh, comorbidities. Um, And there are statistics showing who that is, right? So if we say, okay, those people should get out, but they're going to come back in, you know, it's temporary, whatever. We have to make sure that is, that it is, that is not something that becomes permanent so that then, because the prisons know they can't give healthcare. So you get sick in prison, they say, oh, you can go to your family now and you can get chemo and do all that. And then you have to come back in. <laughs> you know, it's not, a, it's not a change. The other thing, of course, is the nonviolent. You know, we absolutely reject that, that um, division. And then I think that there are, and I'm not part of them directly, but there are groups around the country that are doing amazing restorative justice work. And I know some of the younger people that I know in New York are doing um, these mutual aid and um, community control projects. Like in Brooklyn, there's a number of them and young young people have set them up. Um, and I can, I have a dear friend who wrote a blog post, Sarah Zeller Berkman, daughter of Alan Berkman, oh. and one of my late co-defendants, who just wrote a, a blog post about all these different groups that are doing work in communities who, of course, because of the collapse of the economy, have no jobs and no access to food and stuff. And so communities are replacing those things that used to come from, you know, social service um, networks in the government with local. So that kind of thing, because um, 
the question of abolition isn't just do away with something, it's that we can't ignore violence in the community it's, uh, uh, that, we, that we encounter. It's just that we, communities want to deal with it themselves as opposed to bringing in the police and the prisons. I don't know if that answers it. It's a beginning anyway. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, Donna or Shamika, either one of you want to speak to it too? I think Laura really wrapped it up, but I'll, I'll bring in the pretrial context and um, what we're seeing. So right now, a church called me and said, hey, we want to get out 25 women as a, for Mother's Day, and can you help us? We get these kind of requests from time to time. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm like, yeah, our goal was already to try to get out 40 or 50 more women um, and for Mother's Day. And then I asked the jail for a list of all the women. Um, first, it was hard for them to even give me a list of just women that are incarcerated which was strange to me, but they were able to give me a list of about 250 people. And now we're going through them to see who we can help with our limited resources. And the problems we're running into is that a lot of times when women become just as involved, that all of their bridges are burned in a way that isn't necessarily the same for their male counterparts, meaning they have more support, which is usually other women supporting them, the males do. Mm -hmm that even doing this work with the special project and Louisville Family Justice Advocates as we go to do visitations. When, when I was there my third trip, I said, well, why aren't we doing these for the women? Well, th for 10 years, um, the special project has been operating, going in on weekends, every weekend, doing art activities with the youth. Well, they try one time to, or a couple times to do it for females. Um, and they didn't get the same amount of visits, the same amount of calls, the same amount of resources. And so no one was showing up to bring them their kids to visit them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that is a, that's what we've seen. And we've done some work with SC Justice Group, and some other groups that are focusing on the female populations and what's going on. And it's the same across the board, across our country. Women, when women get justice involved, the bridges are burned and we see it even making the calls to their families. I don't want to talk to this person. And a lot of times they're just as involvement as is a result of their relationship. If they, some, we have a woman who actually her ID was used to purchase kerosene. And like Donna was speaking about some, a fire person died from smoke inhalation and she was charged with murder and uh, she got all these charges and, and the gentleman got out and they had kids together, got their kids. Um, and, and stopped her from getting a kiss. She eventually got out. She had a baby at, that was six weeks old when she was locked up. That woman is now, is, our, is my dear friend Katrina Burns, and now she's out, but she has a, a, a hard time getting jobs and, and navigating the systems because that still goes with her, and she had to fight like hell to get her kids back. So when, some, so when a church it, that means well calls me and says, this is what we want to do, they think that it's easy and it's not, and I had to tell that pastor, you know, I need to tell you that the women that are in there now, it's even harder. There's more challenges. And I cannot promise you that they haven't been charged with a violent charge. I cannot promise you that they haven't been charged with something that was drug related. Are you still ready to move forward? And he said, yes, thank God, because that would have ended our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but So that's what we see a lot of, and it's, and it's harder. Um, and I just had to touch on that because it's a very important thing that I've been learning as I do this work. So talking about transforming the system, we've, as the Bail Project nationally, have bailed out over 10,000 unique individuals and sometimes paying multiple bills to get them out pre-trial. We see them having better outcomes. We see less people going to prison. So we know that it works and we have a better return rate than the court system. So that means who the court lets out on administrative releases we they have a 77 percent return rate ours hovers between 90 and 93 percent so we know that people we're getting people out we're not bail bondsmen someone texted me this morning and said is this the bail bonds lady and you know it's hard to get that that <laughs> out of people's head but we are a revolving community bail fund that uses the resources to get people out and we want we help make sure that they get back to court and and I like you spoke about Laura when people are going back and forth up against the parole board and or these these conditions of release are okay it's COVID now after COVID I don't want to see all these people who've been let out reincarcerated 
And that is the risk that we're running if we don't get it together and set up the systems. And then what I tell people when I talk to them, the community has been holding it up. The, co the community knows how to have a, a non-arrest situation, know how to handle that. We need to teach our police officers that, or just, um, we did cop watch, or one of our my team members do, does cop watch. And in old Louisville, just two weeks ago, there was a custody situation. So they were exchanging the child and an argument broke out. Someone calls the cops, six police cars come up pointing guns and the woman comes out with her baby and a gun is pointed at her. And usually if six police cars are showing up, somebody's going to jail. If there's a domestic situation, they say somebody's going to jail. We help, we bailed a woman out who, when the police came, you can see the scratches on the guy's face because he literally tried to rape her and then choke her to death. You can see his scratches. She went to jail. We, we interview her two days later. She has choke marks that they didn't see when they arrested her, but because he was showing visible marks, they automatically assumed that he was the victim and she's in jail. And so, yeah, I have to work through hell to pay her bail because it's an intimate uh, partner violence. We have the, the jail sometimes who won't let us see certain people because of their charges. So this fight is so hard, but I'm telling you the work of the community, of us working together, of, of me being able to call my white affluent allies and say, can you talk to this judge? Can you talk to this prosecutor? Can you talk to this administrator? That is what's moving the needle. You got more people who are not running off of fear and it's talking about releasing people to the community and letting the community help make the decisions that matter. Fund those community projects that actually work, that actually get people back to work. Don't be scared because one person, you know, they want to legislate around one person did something when they got out. Well, if you haven't changed the situation and got them locked up and they're going right back to the community, what the hell do you think is going to happen? If you don't put the things in place to help people, then when they're getting back out, you can't control it. And so even for our young people, we work to try to get as many out because our juvenile detention center was closing. And I and I, I was in tears. I read one of our clients got basically an accumulation of 15 years probation at 17 years old. So I, when my offense happened in 95 and I was 18, it was hard as hell to get to, through two years of probation because I still was living in the projects. I still was dealing with baby daddy drama. I still, and I'm telling you, it was, it was hoping a prayer that got me to the end of that. This young man is going back to the community with no resources, 17 years old, with 15 years of probation. What, the, what, what, what will probably happen? We, we all know that story. So that is, so you are so right, Laura, when you talk about, we have to be careful when we're talking about these conditions of release. I want them out and I don't want them to have all these strings holding on to them. We had a judge that called HIP a leash. The home incarceration program, he called it a, a leash. And I have issues with the home incarceration program. I think it's from the frying pan to the skillet. But you're right, during this COVID release, if we can get somebody out, our home incarceration clients have the best return rate. And if, if I meet a client and they tell me, oh, I've, I, if they've successfully completed home incarceration for three months or six months, hell yeah, we're bailing them out. Because if, if you can complete that, then that means that you know what you need to do. You know how to jump through those hoops to get back. So I'm not pro home incarceration, but I definitely support people being home with their families by any means necessary. And we need to work towards ending it because that program is problematic. We had a young man, $50,000 bail. We had to pay 10% of that. And he was on home incarceration. His mother stops at a restaurant, 10 minutes stop to get something to eat. On the way home, he was rearrested. We have another young man on the bus. They gave him faulty equipment. His equipment dies while he's on the bus. He has a union job at, at Swift and he gets rearrested because his equipment died and he had no way to charge it. So that is a whole nother, we need a whole nother session to talk about the problems with that. But I'm for doing whatever it takes. There's too many of these things that overlap, um, like was mentioned, um, non-arrest interventions, restorative justice practices work. I've sat through that process with young people, with adults, that does work. There's so many best practices happening around our globe. America has to say, we need to start looking at these best practices and putting them to work because we need, something has to change. And, it, and I have the jail people calling me and saying, we wanna help you. Why are they, 
our jail can't let people out on its own like some of the other jails in Kenton County. They were able to reduce their jail population by one half, but that sheriff had the authority to do that. For our local jail, it's going to take our mayor, it's going to take our governor. But now that the prosecution and all of those who feel like, oh, we've made all these agreements, everybody feels like their work is done. And, and so, it's, so now it's just plowing through what's left. And transforming the system means that we have to continually show that. We have to continue to use our data, our feet, our resources, and everything to keep pushing and showing people that we've tried this incarceration thing for a long time, and whatever we've been doing is damn sure not working. And so what is next? Because these things aren't indicators. You, you had no way to understand that that uh, state representative was going to commit domestic violence during this COVID thing, but he's out. But now you still got all these people in on things that they were charged with. And I totally agree with what Rap is doing. You're not the same person at 18 to 60. And so to still treat people as their this violent thing, you know, I think we just need to redefine that. And we need to start pushing back and saying, our country is violent. Poverty is violent. Have you eliminated all those things? Then, you know, and so as an organization, it's hard. It's hard because personally, I am an abolitionist. I want all of that closed. But when I'm representing my organization, they're waiting for us to F up. You know, they're waiting for me to bail somebody out and they do something else. But you know what's happened? We've bailed people out and all kinds of things have happened, but more good has happened than bad. But what, what keeps us strong in, in Louisville and in our state is the community support, is the work of LSERS, is the work of all the advocates that are working with us, is the, the people raising money. People say, it's my birthday and I want to donate to get people out of jail. That's what's working and that's the whole Re, the whole definition of people power. So that's what we're continuing to use. And so, yeah, I, I think moving forward, we just got to keep lifting that up and we got to keep supporting what's working and proven to work and keep giving that the time, the energy and the resources that it needs. I hope I answered your, your challenging questions, but. <laughs> Absolutely, that was awesome. If there's anybody who's not involved yet, they're gonna get involved now. <laughs> Donna, do you have anything to add? Well. Shamika and Laura, thank you so much. You made my part so very easy and simple. You said it all. Shamika, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, right here in Erie County, we have a sheriff that we've been trying to get out for as long as he's been in there. Uh, he's blatantly said out, right, and, and this is a holding center where you're, you're not even convicted of a crime yet. You're waiting to go to court. He says that, oh, if t only 28 people have died in the 14 years that I've been in office, that's only two a year. I think it's pretty good. Well, I wanted to just uh, vomit at the sound of that because first of all, it was 31 at the time. And how about two is two too many. So we have to keep pushing back. We have to keep finding different ways to make a change, to stand up, um, rapcampaign.com, our website, we've got so many different ways that you can get involved. We're involved with the Parole Preparation Project. They help people who never thought that they would be released to get their records ready to go before parole board. And then we've got to do something about the parole board to make sure that they're staffed with people that look like us, that can identify with the things that we've been going through so that they can show compassion and realize that this person has redeemed themselves. They are ready to come back to the community where they were kidnapped from and held hostage and start to mentor to these young men and women who might very well be getting ready to walk down that same path and make that mistake. No, you're not really about that life. And they can come out and they can show them that. So if we just keep sitting by and saying, okay, whatever, things are not gonna change. But as I can't stress enough, strength and numbers, there's more good stories out here than they're bad, but you'll only hear about the negative stories being looped over and over in the medium. More people have to stand up, talk about the good things. My son, yes, before February 5th, I was the mother of a grown son and a daughter who was incarcerated. My son spent six years. They were holding him hostage in New York State prisons. He returned back to me. My baby came home. He got a job within 
two weeks. He bought a car. He is an upstanding citizen in the community again. So you cannot tell me that this person that committed a crime at 19 is still the same person at 38. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not going to give up. And I say it more often than maybe I should in these cautionary times. This is something that I feel so passionate about. This, my life, my life depends on this. And I'm willing to die for this. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Whew. Um, JT, are, are you seeing any questions there? Yeah, there's a range of them. Some of them have been addressed, some by uh, what, what our speakers are saying. One person asked about the prisoner projects that got uh, canceled um, and whether there's a alternatives to that or sh what should be people be doing around that. Um, another person asked about, um, for more talk about misogyny in the prison system. Uh, some of that I think have been addressed, but, um, and also the relationship of that to uh, other women and feminist movements. Um, and then also what the RAP approach is to juvenile justice and the demonizing of minors and children. So if uh, any of the speakers want to address more on these issues. Can I also add um, something we haven't really talked about in here, but of <clears throat> that we also need to be talking about ICE um, when we're talking about prisons and jails and the ICE detentions and deportations. And um, I just think it's really important that we lift that up as well. Um, so yeah, just wanted to bring that into it. It strikes me about that is that the two movements are totally separate. We don't seem to get together necessarily with, and, and I think very often the people working on ICE and on the immigrants are not that concerned about people in the prison system. I mean, I'm, I'm part of both movements, and it's, it's always very frustrating to me that they don't get together. Well, thank you for that. Do, um, do any of the, the Donna or Shamika or Laura want to address that as well? Um, I, I'm always open to do whatever we can do. Um, I am blessed to be in a position where I can do something that's towards who I am personally and professionally, but I recognize a lot of people don't have that opportunity, but that, that doesn't mean that they haven't been allies. For instance, um, I didn't think that we would have allies and corrections officers, but they have um, sent us people who might be helped by ICE. Um, when I, I asked them if they're holding anyone, we want to get them before the hold gets on them. We are, we've been able to pay some bails before that happened. I think that many of us are limited in what we can do, but we're definitely working through the systems to do what we can and, and definitely want to hold their, their privacy and them being anonymous so that they don't lose their position because we actually need eyes in every level. Um, I, I'm also a part, I just became a board member to La Casita Center. I um, definitely tried to, and I was on the Hispanic Latino Coalition Board. So it's important to me on all levels um, to do what we can for people while we can. I'm working with our organization to, because we have a holding facility in, Bo in Boone County, and I'm working with those um, ice hole, ice related bills can be paid um, from our California office. We actually have an office in San Diego that strictly works to get people out of those detention centers. That's all. That's all that they do. They've been hitting a lot of roadblocks lately. You're exactly right. It is very frustrating. I do want to. I want you to assume that there's more people who want to do more. They just want to know how they can help within the constraints of the work that they're doing. But what I do is I tell my team, we never want to um, give up who our source is, but we want to get in there. When we pull that roster list, if anybody has an international name, we've seen people held just from the last name Ali or Ahmed and just held and, and it's been hard to get them out. And sometimes with it just with their name and it's been hard to even get a, um, an interview. Sometimes we went ahead and worked with a, um, a church or a community member, bail them out and we just get the information we need at the, at the back end. I just wanna keep you encouraged that there are some people who are working within their constraints to, to do what they can. It's not, it's, I want it to be more, it's not enough. And we and I did ask our jail if they were holding people. They had publicly said they weren't, 
but my jail contact said they had when the, when I last checked with them they had three people one was released on home incarceration and two were being held once those holders are put on them we can't even pay a bail for them so we're trying to see how we can work through that and that's here in Louisville Kentucky and the local things that I'm doing I do know nationally my organization other sites are and jurisdictions are able to do stuff too and that's included in our work we definitely include um, that in our work yeah, and I just want to say here that, you know, uh, in my experience here in Louisville, it's very connected. Uh, we have, you know, since COVID-19, every uh, Friday we have what's called Freedom Friday, and it's now national, and we caravan, and our stop is at ICE, and then the jail, and the Hall of Justice. And so it's, it's very connected and lots of different organizations are involved. Um, you know, this past Friday, May 1st, there was a beautiful bicycle contingent headed by mi gente, you know, and it's just, um, I, I think it's really powerful. You know, when I look at these issues, I always look at, okay, what more do we need to be doing? What do we need to be thinking of so that we can connect this more, um, you know, and move the work forward together. So, um, it seems like we're coming toward the end of this. Um, and I, I would love to give people a chance, uh, Laura, Shamika, Donna, to say any last things that you want to say, any, any other calls to action. I feel like this entire thing has been a call to action. You know, I want to encourage people. You know, we're talking about the immediate and the larger long-term struggle. You know, find out what actions are happening near you or make an action happen near you. Um, and, you know, and get in it for the long haul. We're in it for the long haul. And, you know, it's an amazing thing. You get to meet people like the people who have been talking here today. You know, um, it's very powerful and it's a great antidote to despair, you know, to, to be moving forward together. So. Um, I would just love to hear from the three of you. Any last thoughts before we wrap it up? So if I could just say one quick thing to what Fran raised is that, um, yeah, I thought Shamika's answer was really beautiful. Um, I do think, and Roger was, was texting, and I know this is true, we wrap works with people in Westchester County and they've done ICE and all, you know, I mean, we're trying to, bring the things together. I think it's a little more complicated in a huge place like New York, but like RAP is part of um, something called Justice Roadmap, which goes from ICE out of the courts all the way to elders and through uh, solitary confinement. Everything we do has that in it too. Um, I heard uh, my comrade Rabab Abdelhadi say something really interesting on a call about Palestine last week, because someone said, why can't all the groups doing work for justice in Palestine combine into one thing. And she said, no, we don't have to, and we shouldn't, because people have their own strategies, tactics, characters, personalities, you know, whatever. As long as we're all working towards common goals and we cooperate with each other, we respect one another, we struggle with one another openly. And I thought that was such a relief because people are always saying that to us. Why can't there be just one organization that deals with everything? But um, when you look at how change happens, sometimes like this horrible thing happened um, where someone died, right? And all of a sudden you get a lot of attention to an issue. That's what happened when Val Gator died. It was just awful. But we got so much attention to this idea of allowing everyone in prison who's over 55 and has done 15 years to go to the parole board, even if they have a life without parole sentence. And if we can get that passed, we'll do away with life without parole in New York. So that's a specific thing. You know, so you, Fareed used to say, he and I agreed on this, you push on the pressure points. You see something that can change and then create a way to, to change in the future and you push on it. And I think that's okay as long as we do act in solidarity and raise issues together. So that was just one thing. I mean, it's always, it's always aspirational, you know, to, to have more unity. Um, and interestingly enough, in all the work that I've done with different groups working on immigration for years, the same thing comes up about the good immigrants and the bad immigrants, the people who are in for a green card, you know, irregularity and the people who are in for a violent crime, you know, so that's there. 
for action, I do want to say that RAP has been doing, and we're doing um, one this coming week, uh, rallies at the prisons. Um, and I know those are happening in other states too. It's very challenging. You do it with cars. Uh, you know, when, when we're in New York City, people don't have cars, so it's harder. But, you know, in, this, in the suburban areas and upstate, people have cars. So we get car caravans, we get people standing there. And it has been powerful because it brings home the issue of this is where people are being killed or are going to be killed. So we're doing a two-day um, rally this Thursday and Friday. That stuff is on. We have two websites, actually, because we have one now that's called CuomoLetThemGo.com, which is just action items around the COVID area. I would urge people to contribute to Shamika's organization. I think that's right. I'm sure you're raising money for bail. So I think if we could all, if everyone on this call could then, we can get a, a website and contribute there. You can also contribute to RAP, but I think in terms of how the funding is related to the work at this moment, it sounds like um, you know bail money is really important, so you can do both. Um, and just, you know, stay in touch, I think, in terms of now and the future. Um, I think, you know, I'm sure people have either read or heard of Naomi Klein's book, Shock Doctrine, about what happens when there's a disaster and then, uh, you know, corporate interests come in and build, build fascism, basically, take advantage. Well, this is one of those moments. And um, for the left, for progressives, this is a time when we've, when would we all have been in a room together? Right now we're all in a room together talking, sort of. And so we should use what we're building in this moment to carry us into the future and think about ways to consolidate um, power among us. I really agree with what Shamika said too about people power. That's our strategy. We're an organizing, um, we're an organizing group campaign, whatever you call it with RAP. And so thank you all. I'm really glad to be on this. and. I hope to see everyone again. Thanks to all the organizations that are that are represented here too. Surge has been really helpful to wrap because Surge takes up Lumumba Bandeli is the first person who told me about Surge. You know, we were talking about solidarity. He said, Well, I know one group of white people who believe in solidarity. I said, Are they active now? He said, Yeah, it's called Surge, and that's when I got involved. So, you know, thank you and free them all. Free them all. Yeah. Um, wow, Laura wrapped it up for me. I do, I, I wanted to add, yes, Laura, we always have to fundraise, but I will let you know that anything given online to bailproject.org goes directly to building someone out. It doesn't go to my salary or anybody else's is to get people out. We have been in a leader uh, site for many reasons, and one of those reasons are the community support, the, month, the funds we've been able to raise, grassroots, and I'm, I'm on here with some awesome fundraisers. I won't call them out, but they are amazing, and they helped us raise money. Um, I will say that um, public safety has to include people who are incarcerated along with the, uh, their families. I think when, when you hear people pushing back and saying public safety, this and public safety, that make sure that they know that that includes the people that are incarcerated as well as their family. Kentucky is number one with children that have an incarcerated parent. Also, we've moved, Oklahoma has passed us now, Tulsa has passed us, so we're number two with women who are incarcerated. We know that incarceration is a problem. Vera Justice Institute did a report that it, within 100 years, every the, at the rate we're growing, everyone will be incarcerated. So it's important to know the context of where you live and, and what you're doing, and more importantly, know what you're able to do. If you're a person that you only can donate, donate. Make sure you're donating to organizations that are actually where most of that money is getting to the people that are directly impacted. If you are a person that write letters, write those letters, write those letters, write those emails. People do read them. They do pay attention. I'm friends with a lot of elected officials and I help get people elected. I help get a judge elected. They do read them. They read those letters. They read the, that. It is very, very important to do that. 
Um, I am also a mentee of Ann Braden, and that was, I find white people who take action very attractive. I think you're, you're putting your bodies on the line. You're, you're putting yourself out there. You should continue to do that. We need you. We don't need you to beat you up. We just need you to take action because you speak the language to your people. We need you to get in front of this as much as possible. And that, and, and, and even if that is connecting someone else or, or sending an email or writing a letter or joining a Freedom Friday caravan, that is just important. Everything you do is important. Just don't do nothing. Because that arc that folks talk about that bends towards justice, that happens with us working together and doing what we can. I, I see that as very valuable. Um, people like to compare um, Martin and, and Martin, Malcolm and Martin Luther King. And one of the things I like is that I'm one of those people, I'm old school, where I'm like, yes, white people, you could give your money, but I want you to be there with me in this struggle. I want you to take action. I think that that is the most valuable thing you can do. You can't, we can't buy our way out of this work. It's going to take us getting together, working together, and being active. Is That's what's going to get it, because that that's that's what changes hearts and minds. And I know I'm not asking you to argue over Turkey at every Thanksgiving. I, I'm, I'm not saying that. Pick and choose your battles, but do what you can to continue the efforts that we're talking about. And I think political prisoners are that effing rock. If you're not putting 20 years on the line, it's you, you can't complain about shit. Just do something, you know? Um, I think that we we just have to continue to humanize people in this work. You can always go to bailproject.org and get involved, but there's a lot of organizations. I try to fundraise so I don't take from local groups that are doing the work. We do work with the Louisville Community um, Bail Fund, but we help them get out a bunch of young people. Um, and we, we, like I said, we've gotten over 2,000 people out and since 2018. We're still pushing every day um, and we're pushing across the country, but we are a project. So we want to do this work that we can change the system so much that we like to, well, Monday, one of our local jails is shutting down and it's bittersweet, right? It's shutting down because there's not as many people in there, but those, the people who are left are being moved to the main jail and they won't get the releases to go be with their family, to go to work and things like that. So it's bittersweet. One end, I'm happy that that jail is closing, but on the other end, I know what it's going to mean for those families. So our work is cut out to try to get as many more of those people out as possible. We are working with our public defenders to do that. Everybody matters. Our public defender, you know how many side messages and text messages I get from people who are woven into the system? People want to be a part of change. I remember the clerks used to say, I can't believe you're getting those people out. Now we're bailing out their children. And so this issue has now like touched everybody. And I think that this is our, our pro bono attorney, Ted Shaw, says this is our civil right. This is our civil rights fight for the, our time, and I believe it is. Incarceration, derailing mass incarceration, that train is headed towards mass incarceration takes all of us. This bail project work is on the front end, but we need all of you on every end because we want less people in prison. So thank you. Woo! All right. All right. Yes. Donna? Well, the two, they wrapped it up. Thank you so much. All I want to say is power to the people and keep on pushing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Well, we got a lot of action and a lot of resources. We'll make sure everybody gets that. Um, thank you to all of you. And can we unmute for one big loud free them all? Is that possible? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said we need a picture of this. I might do a picture. Free them all. Okay, free them all. 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 Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This was great. Thank you very much.